justliberty.org. It's good for you and it's good for me. Justliberty.org. Justliberty.org. Hi, I'm Amanda Marzullo. A blogger in Laredo known as La Gordi Loca, which roughly translates to fat crazy lady, has been charged with a third degree felony for reporting, quote, information that has not been made public with the intent to obtain a benefit after she posted the names of a suicide victim and a person who died in a car accident online. Prosecutors say the benefit she allegedly sought was more Facebook followers. So Scott, what do you think? You know, it's been a long time since I've worked as a journalist, but from my recollection, the entire job was reporting information that had not been made public, and the only reason you did it was for the benefit of a paycheck. I mean, when you report information that's already been made public, that means you've been scooped. It's kind of an odd <laughs> thing. Yeah, no, it's like they're basically saying that journalism is illegal. Right. They don't want journalists. They want stenographers for the government. Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to the February 2018 edition of the Reasonably Suspicious Podcast covering Texas criminal justice, politics, and policy. I'm Scott Henson, Policy Director at Just Liberty, here today with our good friend Amanda Marzullo, whose day job is Executive Director at the Texas Defender Service. Mandy, what are you looking forward to on the podcast today? Actually, it's our top story. I'm looking forward to talking about some upcoming elections. Me too. Let's get right to it. Okay. Texas primary elections are coming up on March 6th. And there are several district attorney contests and a couple of court of criminal appeals races of which everyone should be aware. Mm -hmm. In Dallas and San Antonio, the action is in the Democratic primary. Big D Democrats are choosing who will oppose the Republican incumbent Faith Johnson, who is appointed by government Abbott. Meanwhile, in San Antonio, Democratic incumbent Nico LaHood faces a strong challenge in a race that has become combative and increasingly negative, with LaHood lashing out at critics and constituents alike. So, Scott, what do you make of these races? Well, these are the two highest profile DA races in the state, no doubt. And in Dallas, what's fascinating to me is for the first time in my adult lifetime, for sure, we're seeing uh, an election where two candidates are competing to see who can be the most reform-minded, who's the most reform-minded DA. And that's extraordinary. And frankly, even Faith Johnson, the Republican in Dallas, has made a lot of noise and movement toward some of these reform angles. And so the, the debate at the Dallas DA's office being so or DA's race being so reform oriented, I think is fascinating. With Nico LaHood, this is an odd race because it's less probably about reform or any sort of typical yeah. issues than this very odd man who is the incumbent. He's being attacked not necessarily for issues around the DA's office, but about being against Muslim immigration and being against people having their children vaccinated. And some of these weird issues that he's brought into this debate have sort of isolated him within the Democratic Party. And then he's made some enemies in the defense bar in San Antonio, mm -hmm. too. And so that's, that's where his strong challenge has, has come from. Meanwhile, Texans should be aware of a few other important prosecutor races. In McLennan County, D.A. Abel Renya faces re-election at a time when cases from the Twin Peaks Biker Massacre are falling apart, with his office facing most of the blame for grandstanding and overreach. In Victoria County, the daughter of a former D.A. is running against the incumbent on a reform agenda, chastising him for a failed policy of taking every first defense DWI case to trial. Mandy, what do you think about these races? Well, I think these two cases are important to watch because I think that they're a big test on voters controlling prosecutors who have gone too far. So in McLennan County, that is a very strange situation. Our listeners will remember that the Twin Peaks biker massacre was a situation where they rounded up over 100 people, almost 200 people who were at the scene of a crime and charged them with a felony. And many of them lingered in prison or in jail, sorry, for you know several months, which you know presumably lost their job. You know, it had huge economic effects and they have yet to get a single conviction three years later. Not only have they not gotten a single conviction, but the DA's office is is dropping out of cases. They tried to get the attorney general's office to take them over. The attorney general's office said no. And so it's all a complete mess. 
And it's fascinating that it's all come to a head right before the primary, <laughs> probably the worst possible time for Abel Renya, but that's that's what it is. And, and and then when it comes to Victoria County, you're dealing with a policy that would generate a huge backlog. Taking every single case to trial is is an incredible demand on the system. It apparently was a complete catastrophe. You know, there's always been this sort of fantasy laid out among the defense bar that, oh, well, if we took every case to trial, it would shut the system down. Well, ironically, <laughs> the prosecutor here tried that. He tried to take every case to trial. N- not every case, just the DWIs. Just but- the DWIs. And two years after he's into the policy, apparently their courts are still completely overwhelmed and it's still causing problems. Yeah. So you're right. These are examples of going after prosecutor overreach in a very specific way that's kind of unusual. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. In Denton County, challenger Brent Bowen says the reputation of incumbent Paul Johnson's office has been marred by lawsuits and misconduct. And in trial, where the DA is not running for re-election, the Smith County District Attorney's Office released an audit that amounted to an opposition research file on one candidate while the sitting DA supported the other. The target of the information released, Jacob Putman, had complained on the campaign trail of, quote, a good old boys club in Smith County for whom it matters more about who you know than what you did. So, Scott, what do you make of these two cases? Well, Smith County is actually my home county. I grew up in Tyler, and Mr. Putman is not the first to say that there's a good old boys club there or that, you know, certain attorneys may get better treatment than than others. These have been allegations that have swirled around Smith County criminal justice for decades. And really what's interesting here is it's the first time that Mm -hmm. those issues are making their way into a DA race. And so as such, you're kind of not surprised to see the DA's office jumping into the race and trying to put their thumb on the scale. We'll see what happens. Tyler's a very insular place, and and Mr. Putman's a brave man to, to take that stance. On the other side of the coin, a couple of other DA races and GOP primaries are being fought along more traditional axes. In Galveston, Jack Rohde faces a primary challenger accusing the incumbent of being soft on crime, And in Walker County, the county seat of which is Huntsville, the first assistant of incumbent David Weeks is battling it out with a civil attorney whose supporters say the DA office isn't tough enough on DWI. So, Mandy, what about these races caught your eye? Well, the Walker County case in particular is catching my eye because of the focus on DWIs. Um, As you noted in our discussions leading up to this, the Walker County position on DWI is probably driven by the driver responsibility surcharge, which, you know, listeners listeners will remember is a non-waivable surcharge that they put on your driver's license if you have certain offenses. And in the case of DWIs, it's fairly hefty. It's $1,500. Per year for three years, in yeah. fact. So that is an, an incredible sum, particularly in some areas of the state where incomes are low. So it's understandable that defendants would seek plea deals that would be to a different offense and that prosecutors might agree to it um, if the circumstances merited it. Right. This has come up at the legislature in recent years. One of the reasons that Mothers Against Drunk Driving finally came out for alternatives to the driver responsibility surcharge was that there's pretty strong evidence that quite a few district attorneys around the state are pleading some of these DWI cases to things like reckless driving or blocking a roadway or things like that so that the person will not have to get this surcharge. And it's been intentional, and it has been cited as a reason why DWI convictions have declined in Texas significantly, even as the number of arrests have stayed about the same. And this is about the driver responsibility surcharge creating such problems for the courts Mm -hmm. in so many other ways 
that the DAs just decide, hey, it's not worth the hassle when I know that person is never going to be able to pay that $1,500. And And it's just going to cause them to not have a driver's license and be... And probably end up back in front of them under a different offense. That's exactly right. So that is what that's about. And it's unfortunate to see that office being attacked as soft on crime for that policy. That's actually a pretty pragmatic policy. And it's unfortunate that that's the terms of debate on that. Yeah, I hope it'll change. Meanwhile, there are a couple of competitive Court of Criminal Appeals races in the GOP primary. Presiding Judge Sharon Keller faces a strong challenge from Justice David Bridges from the Fifth Court of Appeals, and there's a three-way race for an open seat to replace Judge Elsa Alcala. Judge Barbara Hervey ran unopposed. So, Scott, what stands out to you about these races? Well, first of all, let's just say for the record, how much are we going to miss (laughs) Elsa Alcala? I mean, oh, my gosh, she has been wonderful. She has been really a bright, shining star on the court Mm -hmm. for someone who's only been in. I guess she was appointed and then then had one full term. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she was a district court judge before. That's being right. That, well, she was on the she was on the first court of appeals in uh, okay. Houston before she came here. So okay. she went district court, court of appeals, and then court of criminal appeals. But she's been a bright star, and, mm-hmm. and it's really sad to see her go. Many of her dissents have wound up being essentially U.S. Supreme Court majority opinion mm-hmm. fodder, where she dissented in Texas cases, and the Supreme Court ended up siding with her. That's happened a number of times now. Yeah. So thank heavens for her, and I'm I'm sorry to see her go. Yeah, no, we will miss you, Elsa Alcala. Among the races here, the Sharon Keller race is the one that has the potential to be a huge blockbuster. We are in this weird time where there's an incredible hostility toward incumbents. And we've seen in these Court of Criminal Appeals races in the past few cycles that because these are such low information races where voters know almost nothing about any Mm -hmm. of these people, that they kind of just will vote for anybody and anything goes. And the people who got into the, the runoffs two years ago were people who didn't even run real campaigns necessarily sometimes or who mm-hmm. were, were not really engaged. And all of a sudden, they're, they're serious players. So having a sitting appellate court judge run against her is dangerous. And, you know, who knows that she's been there 24 years. And so, you know, the odds are she'll, she'll make it. But if she were to lose, that would be a huge change on the court. She's sort of the intellectual leader yeah. of that government always wins faction. And if she goes, that would change the dynamic on the court oh. quite a lot. As soon as the primaries are over, Just Liberty supporters will be flocking to their precinct conventions, aiming to get criminal justice reform planks into the platforms of both political parties. The group even has a little jingle promoting the campaign, performed by some of the same artists who did our original podcast music. Let's give it a listen. Justice is blind, her hands are full, holding a sword and scales. She has no time for politics, that's why her foes prevail. Today, justice is threatened beyond reasonable doubt. So why not help an old blind lady out? Justice needs a platform, justice needs a platform. Free did I dee, did do did he dum. Justice needs a platform. Justice needs a platform. So, Scott, tell us about Just Liberty's campaign. What do you hope to accomplish? So our goal here is to get substantial criminal justice reform planks into both party platforms. And the way this is done is through the process of participating in party conventions, starting with precinct conventions right after the party primary. Most people have never participated in these processes unless you're a real party insider or Mm -hmm. somebody who, you know, works in politics for a living. But anyone who votes in the primary can participate in their precinct convention and potentially become a delegate to their county convention or even go up to the state convention. 
And at these precinct conventions right after the primary election, they will get an opportunity to propose resolutions to change the party platform. Mm -hmm. Just Liberty has rolled out resolutions related to reducing incarceration in the adult system, closing youth prisons and shifting to community supervision, on indigent defense, on limiting police powers to arrest for Class C misdemeanors. And so folks who are interested in criminal justice reform can pick which ones of these they're interested in, Mm -hmm. take these to their precinct convention, and we're going to try and have a grassroots effort to push all this into the party platforms. Sounds exciting. So how do people participate? So if you're a Democrat on the night of the primary, you simply go back to wherever you voted and there will be a precinct convention held there at 715 the night of the primary election. Mm -hmm. In most counties, you do the exact same thing on the Republican side. However, there's a slight twist and this makes it a little more complicated. In some counties, they let them do it in different ways, and some counties will have their precinct conventions the day of their county convention, three weeks after the Mm -hmm. vote. And so if you want to know how to participate, go sign up on our list at justliberty.org. And as soon as that information about which counties have their precinct conventions win on the Republican side, we'll be getting that out to everybody and give everyone on our list everything they need to participate. Okay, exciting. So stay tuned. That's right. Justice needs a platform. Justice needs a platform. Free da dee 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 do dee dee dum. Justice needs a platform. Justice needs a platform. Free da dee dee Now we're moving on to a game that we call Home Court Advantage, during which we discuss some of the most important decisions in the Lone Star State. In January, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals issued a divided ruling, finding that a police officer did not have probable cause to stop a driver whose wheels touched the fog line delineating the shoulder of the road. Three CCA judges dissented, with presiding Judge Sharon Keller offering a hair-splitting defense of the officer's decision to conduct a stop. The result of the decision was the suppression of drug evidence found when the car was searched. So, Scott, who gains an advantage based on this ruling and why? Really, I think all Texas drivers gain an advantage. What this ruling found was that there has to be at least some actual real probable cause to make a traffic stop. Ever since a Supreme Court case called Wren versus United States um, back in the 90s, what's called a pretext stop, often in drug cases, has been basically allowed, something that the courts have been okay with. And that means that maybe the real reason you're stopping them is you suspect they might have drugs, but you're going to use some traffic offense or or something, in this case, driving on the shoulder as an excuse to pull them over. And the courts over the years have increasingly lowered the bar and said, okay, you really – there doesn't have to be much to the original stop. The pretext is fine. Mm -hmm. Well – We've now gotten to the point where this is saying, okay, can it be completely bogus? Can it just be fake? (laughs) Where, you know, Judge Keller's opinion said that the reason that there might be probable cause is that it was possible that the shadow at one split second may have touched the inside edge of the fog line, but you couldn't really tell. And it's a very hair splitting defense. It was, yeah. it was fascinating. Um, on my blog, I, this case came out right before the Super Bowl. Yeah. And I made the joke that this basically was essentially similar to the, the what is a catch issue <laughs> in the NFL. Hashtag Des caught it. This <laughs> hair splitting thing where, OK, do you have to go all the way over the line? Do you have to be in the shoulder or do you just have to touch the line or what is it? And and all the Byzantine hair splitting issues that you can bring to that potentially is kind of similar and it's almost just as confusing. Yes. And the majority on the court basically said, 
look, we're going to use common sense. We're not going to just go way out of our way to say all stops are okay. Mm -hmm. But three judges dissented on this. There were 13 judges, all told, that ruled on this case. And the only three who wanted to side with the officer and approve the stop were on the Court of Criminal Appeals. So this shows how important these CCA races are because we have judges on there who are not necessarily sort of within the mainstream of the rest Mm. of the judiciary. Good point. Back in July, Mandy and I discussed the case of George Alvarez, a Brownsville teenager who was framed for assaulting a police officer after law enforcement withheld video showing he was the real victim. But a three-judge panel at the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that because Alvarez entered into a guilty plea, he's not entitled to damages for his wrongful conviction. The case will now be heard on bonk by the full Fifth Circuit. So, Mandy, what are the implications of the Fifth Circuit panel's ruling, and who gains an advantage if the decision stands? Well, the implications of the ruling can be fairly sweeping um, in terms of the constitutional context because over 90% of all criminal cases are resolved with a guilty plea. That said, in Texas, we have the Michael Morton Act, which does clarify that this information needs to be disclosed to the defense as soon as possible. Right. This case was actually before the Michael Morton Act was implemented. Yeah. So it, it didn't apply here. So it, it won't necessarily have an implication for court operations. Now, you know, it could affect whether someone is entitled to relief or if they're entitled to damages, as you know, poor Mr. Alvarez apparently has not received yet. That's right. And you told me that there was a split among the circuits on this and that this is possibly something we'll see go to the Supreme Court. Yeah, this isn't an issue that the U.S. Supreme Court has addressed yet and there are decisions in both directions so we'll see. It could be well primed. Next up, our segment, Errors and Updates. We have no errors to report this month that we are aware of but we have several important updates. First, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled against Harris County on most aspects of its bail policies, agreeing with the lower court that past practices were unconstitutional. The county's only win, misdemeanor defendants can be held up to 48 hours as opposed to 24, as Judge Lee Rosenthal's order had put it. It's unclear precisely how this ruling might impact litigation in Dallas or bail policies in other counties. We'll return to this topic in the coming months as the implications become more clear. In another Fifth Circuit case, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice has settled with plaintiffs who allege that unair conditioned cells at the Wallace Pack unit placed heat-sensitive inmates in danger. For now, the settlement only affects one unit, but there are many other inmates in the heat-sensitive categories outlined by the court, and it remains to be seen if other units eventually will also be required to comply. Finally, after I interviewed Brandy Grissom in December about sex abuse scandals at Texas youth prisons, the governor replaced the executive director and board chair at the Texas Department of Juvenile Justice. More controversial, though, was the governor's decision to get rid of the independent ombudsman for TJJD, Debbie Unruh, whose good work had uncovered many of the problems at the agency. On my blog, Grits for Breakfast, I called her firing an example of shooting the messenger. My interview in December with Brandy Grissom was filled with examples where Unruh's work was the only available source of information about serious problems at the agency. She was replaced by a Texas Ranger with no juvenile justice background. Now it's time for our rapid fire segment we call The Last Hurrah. Scott, are you ready? Locked and loaded. Let's do it. (laughs) All right. In Harris County, the juvenile detention center is overflowing because judges are jailing youth for technical probation violations, which account for 70% of all probation revocations. Meanwhile, juvenile crime is way down. So, Scott, does this make sense? makes no sense at all. You'd think if crime goes down, detention numbers would go down. The fact that they're going up means that there's something wrong with the process and the policies. Texas adult prison system has increased wages for entry-level correctional officers to try to reduce high turnover rates. But the move has exacerbated high turnover at Texas youth prisons, which are all situated in rural areas where they compete with adult prisons for employees. So Mandy is the answer to throw more money at this problem. 
Uh, temporarily, yeah, that's that makes sense. That's how they're going to compete for the employees that they need. But longer term, it's not really a workable solution. In the end of the day, they can't staff up to handle the number of people that were incarcerated. Just need to incarcerate fewer people. That's yes. it. Last one, the Great Texas Warrant Roundup is nearly upon us, but but two Texas cities, Fort Worth and Austin, have opted out, with Fort Worth implementing a Warrant Forgiveness Month instead. So Scott, give me the elevator pitch for why more jurisdictions should follow their lead. Well, this is part of the fallout from the legislature trying to address the debtor's prison issues in 2017, and they'd made a good first start, but had not addressed all of the issues surrounding jailing people for criminal justice debt. And so it's good to see these two jurisdictions really taking the lead and pioneering sort of new methods to avoid jailing people for debt whenever possible. Happy to see it. All right. We're out of time, but we'll try and do better the next time. Until then, I'm Amanda Marzua with the Texas Defender Service. And I'm Scott Henson with Just Liberty. Goodbye and thanks for listening. We'll be back next month. And until then, keep fighting for criminal justice reform. It's the only way it's going to happen. And shout out to Brooke Rollins from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Congratulations on your new gig with the Trump administration. <laughs>